Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Life is complicated. I don't mean your life, my life. Those are also complicated. But as we all know, biology is complicated. The history of biology is complicated. Here on Mindscape, you know, I'm interested in very big questions like the origin of life. But we also have the evolution of life, right? That's interesting all by itself. And so there's a bunch of phase transitions that we like to talk about that happened over the course of the evolution of life. One such transition was the origin of eukaryotes, right? Eukaryotes are cells that have nuclei in them. And we think these days that that came about from two different kinds of cells getting together, joining together, sharing their DNA, distributing it in the cell in interesting ways. You have mitochondria and then you have the nuclear DNA. And it's all a big part of the interesting kinds of life we have on Earth. I shouldn't say interesting. It's all interesting. The complex kinds of life we have on Earth. Eukaryotes compared to prokaryotes, which don't have nuclei, have a lot more capacity, a lot more potential for being complex, such as being multicellular. And once you go from a single-celled organism to a multi-cell organism, then the possibilities of complexity grow enormously. So today's guest, Will Ratcliffe, is a biologist who is one of the world's experts on exactly this transition from unicellularity to multicellularity in the evolution of life. Uh, not just studying what happens there in the record of actual life on Earth, but doing artificial evolution, or what some people call directed evolution, doing an experiment in the lab where he takes, he's in a group, take yeast cells, and they let them evolve. They give a little bit of selection pressure to grow bigger, and they say, you know, they don't poke in there the DNA, they just let mutations happen and, and watch what happens to these initially unicellular yeast organisms. Uh, and what happens very quickly is they become multicellular. You know, I, I, in some sense, which we'll hopefully try to make clear in the podcast, yeast and many other eukaryotes are ready to be multicellular in some sense. So a little nudge uh, pushes them in the right direction. But there are surprises that come up along the way. You know, there are different ways to be multicellular, and there's a big difference between multi being multicellular in the sense of just having a lot of cells sticking together versus being truly differentiated with different organs and things like that. And even though the experiments have not been going on very long, there's still thousands of generations that we have uh, ability to look at, and it's taught us something about this crucially important transition which might have implications for, you know, life elsewhere, uh, the idea of life, the future of life even, now that we human beings have the ability to, to actually go in there and poke at the genome of different kinds of organisms and see what happens, you know? Maybe there's whole kinds of genetic information schemes that would lead to different kinds of organisms that evolution was not able to find. I don't know. I'm just a physicist and podcast host, but Will is an expert on this, so let's go. Will Ratcliffe, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So multicellularity, a big thing in the history of life. Uh, we, it, it, no planning on my own part. You know, I, I, I don't plan a series of podcasts in any interesting way, but we have been talking a little bit about the origin of life. Recently did Betul Kachar about uh, what we learned about old life from paleogenomics and so forth. But that was all single-celled stuff, basically. So why don't you put us into context? Like when did multicellularity arise? What do we know about its origins? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be on this sort of path of understanding life's origin and the evolution of complexity. And in some sense, they've already done the hard work because once <laughs> you have a cell, you've already sort of, you know, you've done 95% of the, I actually agree with Nigel Goldenfeld in his recent interview where he said, you know, once you have cells, who cares about elephants? Yeah. To some extent, I agree <laughs> with him. To the other extent, I've made my entire career on disagreeing <laughs> with him. So, so multicellularity is, is when you have uh, an organism that's composed of multiple cells. And, and it opens up all kinds of opportunities for complexity because those cells can take on different roles. You can get all sorts of novel ecologies arising, and you can have organisms with all these specialized functional parts. When multicellularity arose is kind of not really a, 
it's not this there's no one one answer because multicellularity actually has evolved many times in different lineages on earth so we what actually have many fossils mean from, like, uh, like five times yeah. or 500 times um in, in between the two okay <laughs> so it's probably in the in around a hundred although we actually don't oh, have wow. a really right. so robust is, estimate that's a lot though okay um, so that's it's it's a lot some lineages like the green algae it's evolved more than 25 times independently in just green algae alone but isn't it true that life on earth was unicellular for a really really long time yeah so the majority of li so life you know start when life started out pre-cellular and then once you have sort of it becoming cellular that's really a sort of almost a sea change in how right. life you know evolves out information is transmitted vertically and you have sort of cellular revolution and that was probably on the order of 3.8 billion years ago or even earlier like that's about the origin of luca the last universal common ancestor mm -hmm. so the coalescence of of all things can be traced back to that point but there's probably some cellular life before that but it's very very hard to study anything that's, that's that old and um yeah, so and the major the majority of the diversity of life that we have out here today is also single cell, um, right? But different single cell lineages began exploring with multicellularity at different time points. So cyanobacteria began forming chains of cells in which you'd have cells that are specialized for carbon fixation through photosynthesis or nitrogen fixation by basically taking nitrogen from the air and turning it into ammonium, which can be used in building proteins and stuff. And that happened around two point one billion years ago. And then you have, that's all, and, and different types of bacteria played around with multicellularity in between 2 billion and 1 billion years ago. And they've all remained pretty small and simple. And then you have eukaryotes arise. Mm. And eukaryotes are a special kind of single-celled organism. They're actually the result of a fusion between a uh, archaea and uh, alpha proteobacterium. That alpha proteobacterium was at one point a symbiont and became domesticated as our mitochondrion to sort of provide energy for our cells. And these eukaryotic cells have really sort of run away with with a, with sort of, I don't know, uh, forming different kinds of organisms that bacteria and archaea don't really seem to be able to form. So sorry, and what yeah. you just said about the origin of the eukaryotes, the, the cells yes. with, with nuclei in them, mm -hmm. uh, you sounded pretty confident. I'm, I'm not sure uh, from my own you know, naive physicist reading, uh, do, are, are we pretty confident that we really know how that started and, and, and why it started? Or, or We're is, getting is this more and more confident. Yeah, okay, so good. There, so as we find these uh, archaea from the Loki archaeota and, and other sort of Asgard-related it's a great acronym, right? <laughs> I don't actually know what it stands for, but this, there's this clade of archaea um, that have been found in sort of seafloor sediments in the, in the Arctic, I guess the near Arctic. And these things have all sorts of eukaryote specific cell biology, things mm -hmm. that we thought only eukaryotes have. And it turns out that they are archaea. And if you look at them on a phylogenetic tree, which is like a tree of like a, like a genealogical tree, but applied to vast timescales and not just, you know, your, your, your local family, um, then you can see that they actually nest as a sister group to eukaryotes. So okay. we're pretty sure that archaea, um, and, and there's, and if you, if you sort of begin to disentangle and unpack how eukaryotes arose, you really see that we basically have a, that eukaryotic cells have a mixture of archaeal stuff and bacterial stuff, like our, the, the lipid membrane that we have surrounding our cells is actually bacterial. <laughs> okay. It's not archaeal. They use a different kind of, of chemistry in, in, the, in their lipids, which, which make the membrane of the cell. And we think that actually came over from the, um, from the mitochondria. So the nucleus was the archaea, and then the big puffy part was the bacteria, or vice versa? So we don't, actually, I think those details we don't really know. Those okay. are still the kinds of things we're working out. But I think a better way of thinking about it is that the cell as a whole, like the macro, like the, 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 the larger symbiont, yeah. was the archaea. Okay. And that sort of got smaller bacteria living within it and those bacteria that sort of co-opted to being a part of this new eukaryotic cell they can't divide on their own anymore they still have a remnant little genome right so if you look at mm -hmm. it inside a mitochondrion it has its own genome which is you know one of those things that, that made people realize you know 40 years ago oh my gosh like these things were once free living separate cells Right. So this is this is I know probably a lot of people in the audience know this very well, but maybe there are some who don't. And it's so amazing. I really want to just sit and, and dwell on it, that there's two different sets of DNA in every one of our cells. There's, you know, our DNA and then there's these little free riding, not free riding, but symbiotic uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, in every one of our cells. And so we sort of 
genetically pass down both from generation to generation. Yeah, and the and the and the the, G, the DNA inside a mitochondria is totally stripped down. Like mm. if you imagine that it was at one point a car, now it is just the steering wheel. Or I don't know what the better analogy is, right. but but you know it's it's you know twenty thousand DNA bases when a free living bacteria is typically on the order of a few million. Cool. So, so they're just they're teeny. Yeah. Yeah. And so in fact, most of the DNA from from the uh, genome of the mitochondria has been exported and is now residing inside our our chromosomes. Oh, OK. All right. So we co-opted the the useful parts of it. And there's some of the useful parts. Other useful parts are still hanging out in the mitochondria. Um, yeah, certain elements of it, it seems like it's kind of hard to move them into the mitochondria through those membranes into the mitochondria. And it's better just to have them made locally. But other stuff you want top-down host control and so you just move that stuff into the to the domain of the host and it was this you know we love phase transitions here on the mindscape mm. podcast so this this uh leap from uh prokaryoticness to eukaryoticness mm -hmm. was a big phase transition and you're saying that that enabled new kinds of multicellularity or made it easier it certainly seems that way although we don't have a first principles you know universally accepted explanation for why that's true <laughs> so when you look at sort of the tapestry of multicellular organisms, there are bacterial and archaeal multicellular organisms, but they're very, very simple. Mm. They've been around for a really long time, billions of years, and they don't seem to have really done much beyond making small groups of cells. Within eukaryotes, though, you have the entire sort of complex tapestry of life that you see when you look out your window, right? Mm -hmm. You see trees, you see things growing on those trees, you see insects buzzing around those, you see mushrooms growing off of logs. All of those things are eukaryotic multicellular organisms. And multicellularity, one of the great features of it is it's like the sort of anti-Anna Karenina thing, right? <laughs> and unlike all multicellular families being alike in the same way, right? They're in fact all very, very different. Every multicellular lineage does multicellularity in its own specific way. You know, free living um, algae in, in ponds that, that form spherical colonies of multicellular cells that spin around with you know, flagella that keep them modal are very different from plants, which are essentially sure. growing into the air and competing for light, which are very different from animals, which are very different from fungi. So in some sense, it's a challenge to try to come up with universal rules for understanding how multicellular organisms evolve and become more complex. On the other hand, we actually, we can still do that. But, but you have to keep in mind that every lineage has its own ways of becoming multicellular that depend on its specific ecology and very importantly, the cell biology of the ancestor. Is it just too simplistic to imagine that being eukaryotic uh, provides a bit more flexibility when it comes to being multicellular in the sense that a good, robust multicellular organism will, each cell has the same DNA, but it gets expressed in different ways. And being a eukaryote uh, enables sort of more flavors for that. Yeah, that's actually, you kind of nailed the explanation that people have, which is that eukaryotic cells have a much larger number of sort of types of gene regulation available to them, and it's easier to get cellular differentiation in eukaryotes. Right. They also tend to be larger cells with more complex forms of cellular morphology. Mm -hmm. the, the ancestors of, of eukaryotes, off, eukaryotes often have like, at least if we look at like, the, the best work in this area has been done by people looking at the unicellular relatives of animals. Okay. So animals right, evolved roughly 800 million years ago. And, you know, if you go back to the sort of family tree just one step above animals there's things which which you know are a common ancestor of animals and things which have stayed single celled and if you look at those things that have stayed single celled they often have these complex life cycles where they can exist as an amoeboid and, and crawl around which looks a lot like you know <laughs> one of your blood cells that's going off okay. and trying to kill pathogens right it can exist as a flagellated state where it's mm. swimming which looks a lot like a sperm cell it can exist in many different sort of temporal types of cell differentiation which you could imagine get sort of reworked from being expressed in time to expressed in space. And now you have all these sort of modules to play with for building a multicellular organism. Yeah, and it's also kind of cool because in some sense, a little bit of complexity at the micro level is enabling much greater complexity at the macro level. Absolutely. And But, but I, I just, I, I want to caution that this is consistent with what we understand, but I don't know if it's it's not universally accepted yet perfectly because fair. bacteria <laughs> are, and archaea are extraordinarily complex and diverse and it's kind of hard to find something that eukaryotes can do that they can't do if that okay. makes sense yeah no that no, makes perfect sense um so this was so this transition to eukaryotes was about 800 million years ago 
that was probably more on the order of about 2 billion years oh, ago. Oh, 2 billion years ago. Okay. Yeah, animals were roughly 800 million years ago. I see. Okay. So eukaryotes. So the story that I was that, that I have in mind of uh, it taking a long time for multicellularity to arise sort of gets divided into it took a, a medium long time to be eukaryotic and then another medium long time to be multicellular, right? That's right. Yeah. So in the eukaryotic space, you know, eukaryotes arise around 2 billion years ago. And then roughly a billion years later, you start to see the first lineages of like bona fide eukaryotic multicellular organisms arising and still sort of persisting to the, to the modern day. So you see, and, and this really occurs in red and green algae, interestingly mm-hmm. enough. So you get these small little algae that form branched, you know, topologically structured, like little trees, branched multicellular groups, which if you look at the fossils and look at modern day ones, oh my gosh, they look basically the same. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. It, this whole story is just uh, bizarre to a physicist because we think of systems as being characterized by time scales. And mm. if you don't know any better, there's a certain time scale that governs everything that happens. And presumably the time scale for a microorganism is, you know, is lifetime or it's time to uh, uh, split or something like that. And mm-hmm. those numbers are much, much smaller than a billion years. <laughs> so for some, right. for something interesting <laughs> to happen, but for it to take a billion years to happen is, is just a reminder that physics is not very good at estimating certain things. <laughs> right. And, and the, the time scales that things, I, th- I think something that we, we kind of keep learning in evolutionary biology is that the potential for something to evolve in a certain way is often extreme. It's it, it's often kind of unlimited over sort of geological timescales. Like things right. can evolve very, very, very quickly given suitable selection. And often, when you see stasis, it's simply because you don't have any selection, you know, any you know, significant selection sure. on on the organism's state. And so, um, during that you know one two billion years to roughly five hundred and forty million years before the present, you had an, an era of very, very low environmental oxygen. Mm-hmm. And so that actually, in some ways, changes the expectations of, of whether, whether you expect to see multicyclarity and what types of multicyclarity you expect to see. When you give the charity, how much impact will your donation actually have? This question can be hard, if not impossible, to know. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. You may know it will theoretically help a cause, but how, or more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-based, high-impact charities, I recommend you check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 20,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only recommends a few of the highest impact, evidence-based charities they found. And here's the best part. GiveWell is free. GiveWell wants to empower as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about their donations. They publish all of the research and recommendations on their site for free, no sign-up required. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity you choose without taking a cut. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $250 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. So to claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, pick podcast, and enter Mindscape at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Mindscape to get your donation matched. Well, I guess that was going to be that was going to be my question. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of multicellular organisms myself, being one. But uh, from the evolutionary point of view, what was the benefit to becoming multicellular? And and I guess you've already yeah. started saying something about oxygen. Well, yeah, there's a lot of different benefits to multicellularity. This is again goes back to the sort of uh, reverse anachronism problem, right? Yeah. Where every lineage has its own sort of reasons to become multicellular. So there's no one sort of reason to do it. Uh, in some cases, you have organisms that are forming groups in order to avoid being consumed by predators because predators are filter feeding and they have a small mouth. And if something bonks against their face and can't get in their mouth, then they're not eaten. So it's good to form a group. In other cases, you have organisms that are cooperating metabolically. They're excreting stuff into the environment. And if you can get a sort of clump of cells that are all cooperating and excreting enzymes into the environment, you can degrade environmental stuff much better than if it's a chimera, a chaotic mix of different species and things that are maybe not producing the enzymes, et cetera. Um, there are, 
there's actually a whole list of, we're actually working on a review paper on this right now. I could, I could go on and on, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> what matters is that there's lots of different reasons to come up with cellular. Maybe okay. one that's really relevant to algae or photosynthetic organisms is that, you know, light is this very valuable resource, but it's directional. So if you can overgrow your competitors, All you, right. you get the food. And, and that's why we have, you know, 300 feet, foot tall trees. They're not like getting more sun by being 300 feet tall than, than something sitting on the ground. They're just getting to it first. <laughs> well, they're they're not being uh, overgrown by somebody else, right? When you're the tallest exactly. one in, in exactly. the forest. So it's an arms race, yeah, right? Okay. Like trees are the result of a 450 million year long arms race. But then I, I, I so, do want to let you go into more about the oxygen stuff because that clearly was relevant. Yes, yes. Okay, so oxygen is, is very important um, in the sense that we really see sort of, if you look back at the, the history of multicellularity, you see these sort of experiments in, in, in let me just talk about how oxygen's happened on Earth first. Mm. The great oxidation event, which I think is a great term, very much <laughs> named by geologists because it took several hundred million years for this event to occur, um, occurred roughly 2.1 billion years ago mm -hmm. in, that, in that era. A couple hundred million years, you have cyanobacteria cracking out so much oxygen that we go from a world that basically is anaerobic to one that actually has oxygen in the atmosphere and in the oceans. It's, but it's at very, very low levels, like maybe 1% of modern levels, maybe lower. It's at very low levels and it stays low for the next one and a half billion years. And then in the Phanerozoic era, <laughs> which is about 540 million years before now, it starts to really rise. And that's actually concordant with this explosion in multicellular diversity. You have you know, the Cambrian explosion in animals happening right about that time. Plants, land plants kind of invade, not that much longer, right? Mm. Um, and fungi, they've been around for a while. We actually don't have a great understanding of the origin and diversification of fungi. Um, but fungi seem to really also diversify uh, around this time as well. And so we've long thought that oxygen was this kind of catalyst for multicellularity, right. that, that if you give some, a system oxygen, you're going to enable the evolution of larger, more complex multicellular organisms. And there's a very good physical reason for this, which is that if cells depend on having oxygen and, and you form a group, then you become diffusion limited. And those internal cells don't have access to very much oxygen. And therefore, that might set a maximum size on an organism. Um, because, you know, basically, if, if you can't get oxygen to the interior, maybe those cells can't survive at all. That sets a maximum size to the organism. And so until you can invent a circulatory system, you're stuck with diffusion. And therefore, size is just directly a function of oxygen concentration. We thought this way for a long time. This isn't something we have actually tested, though. So a postdoc in my group, Ozan Bozdag, did this cool experiment where he took um, our, our yeast system. Maybe this is a good time to introduce it. Well, well, keep uh, keep talking. We'll go back to the yeast. Don't worry. All right. Good, good, good. <laughs> in, in any case, um, although, okay. You just can't explain it without. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to explain our change in thinking about oxygen without referencing the experiment, because that was what what helped us understand. Okay, this, that, that's Should we go back fair. and just talk oxygen in general? Yeah, no, no let's, let's just like uh, note that w the, the point is that, uh, you know, when I talked to Betuel, we talked about the great oxygenation event uh, yeah. two billion years ago. And mm -hmm. what, what you're emphasizing is that's nothing. There was another <laughs> growth of oxygen by a factor of 100 later on. Right. And right, right, right. there's this, uh, you know, it's, it's not completely clear why that happens and we're going to illuminate maybe why it happens by talking about yeast so let's let's pause there and talk about yeast for a while you know uh what's a yeast and why do you care about it so so yeast are a single-celled fungus and i care about them because they're a really wonderful model organism for laboratory experiments and, and, and we all this is, we're in the middle of pandemic and everyone is baking bread so we're all familiar <laughs> with right. yeast but so this is a so it's a fungus uh which is um what what kingdom is that in that's a plant that's a no sorry not a plant it's a fungus obviously but it's a eukaryote it's a eukaryote yeah it's a yeah, e yeah, eukaryotic yeah. Mm -hmm. fungus single cell yeah it's a single-celled eukaryote, um, and they actually, the funny thing about the yeast, the, uh, yeast is a generic term for any single-celled fungus. The yeast oh, that we okay. use is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And so, so there's many different yeasts, and they're, they can actually be very, very diverse. Uh, there's yeast from, you know, very different branches of the fungal tree of life. It actually seems to be a kind of a common strategy, and this is the only multicellular group that does this, where you'll have things which formed filamentous multicellular fungi, they'll actually evolve to form single-celled yeast. And in fact, the yeast that we work on, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the baker's yeast, 
the most common yeast mm. used by humanity. It's sort of domesticated by humans for brewing beer and baking bread. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also in many ways like one of the most well-studied and extensively used uh, workhorses of molecular, molecular and cellular biology in the research community. And it's, it's very, very easy to make it do what you want. You can, you can, <laughs> you know, you can basically do crazy synthetic biology experiments very easily in yeast because you can just kind of stick genes in them and they'll express them and it works. I mean, that's clearly very useful. And also I get the impression yes. that, you know, even if yeasts are unicellular, they're kind of living on the edge of wanting to be multicellular. I think that's probably true. Um, certainly in our case, our yeast derived, descended from a multicellular ancestor, but that was several hundred million years ago. So what does and that it, even mean? And so during that time, they've be... really lost much of their genome that, that we know multicellular fungi have. They seem to have just jettisoned it all. Okay. So they devolved in, <laughs> in some yes, sense. Yes. Yes. Yep. And this is very rare in the, in the palette of multicellularity. You don't see unicellular descendants of animals or plants right. running around nature, but right. fungi seem to do this all the time. I see. So the yeast you're dealing with uh, were formerly a multicellular organism, and now they like to be unicellular. Yeah, they've been unicellular for a long time. And then you, so it's not completely surprising that you can sort of prod them in different ways and mutate them and get them back to being multicellular. Yeah, it may not be that surprising, though I don't think they're actually reactivating like latent ancestral pathways of multicellularity. Oh, okay. I think it's actually just pretty easy for them to, in our case, we understand the cell biology of how they become multicellular in our lab very well. And you can just break the machinery that normally allows daughter cells to separate from a mother cell after they're done grow dividing. And I then see. you just get these tree-like, you know, multicellular, you know, groups forming. So you're not actually bringing back to life the multicellular organism that it used to be. You're sort of creating a different kind of multicellular yeast. Exactly. And these are the snowflakes. Is that right? Yes. So tell us about the snowflakes. Okay. So about 10 years ago, when I was actually a fifth year grad student, um, sort of, I guess, avoiding writing up my thesis, <laughs> I started a collab. <laughs> I think you've known them. I know them oh, in my yeah. lab now. Sorry if they're yep. listening to this. <laughs> I started a collaboration with Mike Travisano at the University of Minnesota um, to basically, we had a coffee chat where we we're like, what's the coolest thing we could do in the lab? You know, after we discussing origin of life as being too difficult for us <laughs> biologists and we're not chemists. So it's, you know, we don't yeah. know how to do that. Like maybe we should play around with evolving multicellularity. And so um, over December, I started doing these experiments, selecting on single cell yeast to form groups. And we did a really simple selection experiment in the lab. And these selection experiments are kind of like selective breeding in the way that we have, you know, we've domesticated dogs and we've made wheat and corn from wild relatives. It's basically a selective breeding experiment. The fancy mm -hmm. term now is either experimental evolution or, or directed evolution. And so we did this really simple selection experiment where we took our yeast and every day, you know, they, they, we dilute them 100 fold into fresh media. Those cells grow up, and then we put them through sort of a race to get to the bottom of the test tube. Okay. So we give them, you know, a few minutes sitting on the bench to get to the bottom of the test tube, and then any of the ones that are at the bottom of the test tube get transferred to fresh media. Everyone else is killed. And so this really incentivizes them to form groups because groups settle through liquid media faster than single cells. So, sorry, just to be clear, the mutations in the DNA mm -hmm. are completely natural. You're not inducing that's them, right. but this yep. selection pressure is what you are. That's the directed and directed evolution, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And we don't really think necessarily that settling faster is a reason that things will become multicellular in nature. Although there's recent work out of mm -hmm. Omaya Doden's lab showing this for a uh, a relative, a unicellular relative of animals. But in, in the way that we think of it is, it's really just a very expedient way to select on size. And that's what all these sort of lineages that are, that are experimenting with multicellularity are getting advantages from. There has to be an advantage to size. Otherwise things stay, stay single celled. Hmm. Like most lineages stay single celled. Some of them have an advantage of forming groups and those ones are selected to form groups. And so we're just doing that selection in a really efficient way. You know, we can select on a million clusters in a few in a few minutes of sitting on the bench and a 10 second pipette transfer. So you're not I mean, al alternatively, in a synthetic biology sort of mm -hmm. context, we might go in there and remove a bit of DNA, a gene mm -hmm. and, and replace it with something else. But you're in this particular case, you're actually just letting a mutation happen. So in the very first experiments, we didn't know what would happen. And we just 
you know, let we just let these mutations occur. And within a few weeks, these populations had all formed these beautiful little groups that we call snowflake yeast. We came up with that term, actually, because uh, they settle much like sort of snow settling through the liquid media. And oh. they actually have this cool fractal-like growth form where if you break off a small branch, it's self-similar to the, to the morphology of the larger group. You can imagine that they're growing as a tree. And if you break off a sort of right. small branch of the tree, it looks a lot like the bigger, the bigger overall tree growth form. And also, we were in Minnesota in December, so there was a lot of snow around. <laughs> but, you know, actually, all of our experiments that we do now, we start them out with using the synthetic approach to basically delete a gene that, that was the one that was most often mutated in the natural experiments at the beginning of our, at the, to start our experiments off, right. we just remove that bit of DNA to make them all snowflakes in the same way. And then we can basically replay multiple parallel runs of our experiments, but they're all starting out in exactly the same multicellular state, these simple ancestral snowflakes. But is it safe to say that it's just one gene you have to remove to make uh, a unicellular yeast into a snowflake? I mean, that ge That's gives right. evidence that it's right there on the edge of being ready to be it's multicellular. Yeah, it's super easy, but it's that's probably true for most unicellular organisms. OK. Oh, OK. So, okay. yeah, you know, we've played around with algae uh, and, and doing similar experiments in Chlamydomonas, which is a model green alga. It's also very easy to form groups. And you can do similar things with bacteria and get them to form chains. And, and there's basically cell division has to be done correctly in order to get one cell to pop off a daughter cell and have them both separate. And there's a lot of ways to kind of break that division process in a way that gives you a simple group of cells. So, yeah. So basically, it's very similar to being unicellular, but you're sticking together, literally sticking together. <laughs> exactly. Like, I think of them as naive. Like, they are not a multicellular organism. Yeah. They are a dumb clump of cells. Right. Okay. And in fact, to become a multicellular organism is an evolutionary transformation. Okay. And uh, do these at all, they must occasionally appear in nature if that's the case. Like, you must get a mutation that uh, creates a yeast snowflake. I mean, certainly they do. Uh, this, okay. this mutation rate's <laughs> fairly, fairly high, uh, but we don't typically see them floating around, uh, you know, on on rotting fruit or in the the sap of oak trees, which is where you typically find Saccharomyces in its natural habitat. You don't really find snowflakes, and I, I think the the reason for that is that it's ecologically costly for them in this environment. If you're, you know, if you're making a living as a yeast and basically mm -hmm. being moved from one sugar source to another dispersal is is a premium virtue right and if you and you know your next eight generations of offspring are all stuck together in one big group and and a fly doesn't come down and pick you up on its foot and transfer you you're dead so it's every so cell I, for I itself it's basically reverse bed hedging okay and uh okay good are we then ready to talk about the oxygen the role of oxygen why, sure. why it was helpful yeah. yeah yep so so our lab uh specializes in using experimental evolution to study key steps in the evolution of multicellularity and multicellular complexity. Mm -hmm. And our main model system are these snowflake yeast. So getting back to, to oxygen, like looking at the tapestry of, of oxygen on the history of Earth, we know that it sort of went from zero to maybe 1% 2 billion years ago, stayed very low for the next billion and a half years, and then it smashed up to modern levels around 500 million years ago. And we've long thought that sort of oxygen was this fuel for the multicellular fire, that, that because it diffuses more deeply into tissues, the size of a, of a simple multicellular organism without a, uh, without a circulatory system is just dependent on the concentration of oxygen in the environment. And therefore, you have this sort of monotonic dependence. As you add more oxygen, you get bigger organisms. And, but, but no one's really ever tested this, and there's a couple reasons, but one of them is that we haven't had a model system that we could evolve <laughs> of, of multicellularity, something which we could put through a thousand generations or more in the lab and actually explore its evolution. We haven't had a model system where we can toggle the way that they use oxygen, because this actually turns out to be very important. If you assume that the cells in your organism all have to use oxygen to grow, well, then you sort of really limit that you, 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 you've put an assumption to the system that's very much going to dictate the outcome, which is sure. that if you say, if you don't have any oxygen, that cell dies, well, then you really restrict them to being, to being small when there's not much oxygen. But it turns out that the ancestral state of eukaryotes were, were called mixotrophs. That is, they could ferment without oxygen when they had fermentable carbon, or they could switch over to using you know, mitochondria to respire when there was oxygen available. And that's a pretty sensical strategy in a world where oxygen is very, very low. You don't want to be an obligate aerobe if there's not much oxygen in the world. So just to, again, to sort of linger on this, because it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, bef so since there is oxygen, if there is oxygen mm -hmm. in the world, 
respiration is a useful way to bring energy to your internal cellular workings. And the alternative you're saying is fermentation, which again, That's right. a, lot of, a lot of alcohol related uh, terminology yes. <laughs> here, but what exactly is fermentation in this context? Fermentation is, is just a metabolic strategy in which you break apart carbon, you know, polymers and you get some energy out of that, okay. but you don't, you don't use oxygen to sort of burn them. So before there was a, a surfeit of oxygen, you could get energy yes. from fermentation. If there was enough oxygen, it's more efficient to just do respiration. Yeah. So oxygen provides two huge benefits. One, you can get a lot more energy out of the, out of the resource up to 18 times more energy, you know, it's, so it's, you can, you can get a lot more out of it. Yeah. And two, some kinds of carbon compounds cannot be fermented, but they can be respired. Hmm. So it's, in that sense, it's kind of a cofactor in letting you eat something <laughs> that if you don't have the oxygen, you can't eat it. Okay, good. Which is actually true for getting back to, you know, alcohol. You know, yeast can eat alcohol, but they need oxygen to do it. Hmm. So when you're when you're making your beer, people have the airlock on there and they're trying not to let oxygen get into their into their you know fermenter, and that's because they don't want the yeast to eat the alcohol. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you finally got the right answer, the stars align and the numbers add up. The fastest way to reach your potential is with the right people in place. If you're hiring, you need Indeed. Indeed is a hiring partner that gets you what you really want, a short list of quality candidates as fast as possible, because you can do it all, attract, interview, and hire all at Indeed. So you don't have to struggle on your own to find quality candidates. Indeed will help you hire the right people right now. And Indeed will partner with you on every step of the hiring process. So you can find talent with the skills you need through tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Get started right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Mindscape. That's a $75 credit at Indeed.com slash Mindscape. Indeed.com slash Mindscape, offer valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, good. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you talking about the usefulness of the oxygen to the yeast. Okay, yeah. So, so what we have is a question. How does the evolution of multicellular size depend on the presence of oxygen? We've had this long assumption that it's monotonic, that you, the more oxygen you give them, the bigger they can get. And we have now this, this yeast model system where we can evolve them in the lab and we can, we can go through about five generations of evolution per day. So, you know, in a year, you're, you know, at over a thousand generations. It's, you can really push, push their evolution fast and we can select on size very easily. And then we can actually mess with yeast. Yeast are a great model organism. And we can basically make them fermentation only. So we can basically make them anaerobic. And we do that by basically breaking their mitochondria. They have mitochondria. Okay. We yeah. can break them. Yep. So, okay, their mitochondria don't work anymore. <laughs> they can only ferment. Then we can actually, we can make them respire only. So they can only grow using oxygen. Or we can let them do both. We can let them be, their, the native state of yeast actually is to be a mixotroph, just like the native, the ancestral state of eukaryotes. They can either ferment or respire depending on what that cell wants to do. So we took all three of these different kinds of snowflake yeast, which were otherwise identical at the start of the experiment, and we evolved them with selection for larger size. And we didn't get what we expected. We expected <laughs> that the more oxygen they had, oh, and, and I should say, we also did this um, with, with different environmental oxygen. Okay. So we gave them low environmental oxygen or high environmental oxygen. And we gave them high by basically just bubbling that stuff through, through right. their tubes. So, so there's a lot going on here, but yeah. what happens is when we evolve them, what we find is that unlike the expectation that the more oxygen they have, the bigger they get, we find that when they have no oxygen, that is they're an anaerobe, or they have a low amount of oxygen, it doesn't matter if they're a mixotroph or an obligate aerobe, or they have high amounts of oxygen, right? We end up getting this Nike swoosh. It's not a monotonic <laughs> increase. They get really big when they have no oxygen. They evolve to be really big when they have lots of oxygen. And when oxygen is limiting, they actually stayed small. It didn't really get very much bigger at all, despite a thousand generations of us every day selecting for bigger and bigger size. But is it only the fermenters that get big when there's no oxygen? So actually, that's how we make, gave them no oxygen. Rather than removing oxygen from the test tubes, we just removed their ability to use it. So the fermenters okay. are essentially in the no, no oxygen world in, in our experiment. Okay. And those guys got big. 
the ones which could use oxygen, if they had a little bit of oxygen, they were actually much smaller than the fermenters. But if we pumped in tons of oxygen to their test tubes, then they became very large. So what does that imply for us about the evolutionary history? You're saying that, you know, as, as oxygen increases, first it mm -hmm. gets worse for the yeast. If we mm -hmm. sort of anthropomorphize a little bit and think that getting bigger mm -hmm. is good, right? You know, mm -hmm. it, it indicates a healthy kind of unicellular yeast. Uh, as oxygen comes into the atmosphere, it's initially bad. Is that a safe conclusion? Yeah. But first, let me say, rather than saying bigger is healthier... I would say that bigger is necessary for evolving complexity. Okay. It, it provides opportunities for cells to evolve different roles and functions. And in fact, uh, Andy Knoll has, has written very persuasively that size itself is a driver of, of increased complexity. Like once you have a big organism, now you really have an incentive to evolve a circulatory system and mechanisms of cellular communication and resource transport within the organism. So... So size probably came first and complexity probably followed, okay, which is one reason that we're so interested in size. But there is, this is a provocative statement. So th there is a chicken and egg problem. Um, is it that once the cells get big, they want or need to be complex so they can differentiate? Or is it that once the cells get big, they have the capacity to become complex and that's intrinsically useful? I would say neither. I would say <laughs> once the cell, once the groups get large, there is an evolutionary incentive to evolve the kinds of behaviors that drive increased complexity. Okay. So they don't necessarily want to. There's no in, internal, you know, desire in a yeast cluster or you know a clump of cells in nature. Um, but there is an advantage associated with that kind of differentiation once right. you have size, because once you have size, you have all of these diffusion limitations that make that make growth very difficult. And also it provides advantages, right? You have the opportunity for an inside outside environment. You know, you can localize food to being in the center of your organism mm. and therefore it doesn't leak out. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why once you have a big group, there are advantages to evolving essentially the kinds of interactions and integration amongst the cells in the organism that, that typically drive increased complexity. Okay. And so then getting back to the evolutionary history, it sounds like we're on the verge of saying that the first great oxygenation event didn't really help because a little bit of oxygen slows you down. But but once it went way up, then it became beneficial from this is what your yeast uh, experiments are teaching us. Then it became exactly. beneficial to become more multicellular. Exactly. That's exactly right. That at okay. first, it, we probably would have been better off <laughs> without the great oxidation event. And, and in fact, geologists call that period of time between 2 billion years and 1 billion years ago, the quote unquote boring billion. Right. <laughs> because, you know, there's not that much not happening, happening. In, the bio, in the biosphere that's at least apparent in the geological record. I'm sure there's all sorts of really interesting, you know, single cell microbial biochemistry and evolution happening, but you don't see that really in the, in the fossil record. And so during that sort of, you know, low oxygen boring billion, oxygen may in fact have acted as a constraint. And I'll just throw one more thing in there. The reason why we think that we got this Nike swoosh effect is not just artifacts of metabolism or some or some sort of you know short-term um, proximate explanation. But we actually built an evolutionary model to understand this effect better. And it turns out that if you build a very simple first principles model, then you, you can recapitulate this behavior and it's extraordinarily robust. And the intuition actually is that oxygen is a, is a valuable resource. Mm -hmm. And so if you have no oxygen, well, there's nothing to compete for. If you give a, a system a little bit of oxygen, well, now all of a sudden, those groups that can better utilize that oxygen have an advantage. And in fact, that provides an incentive to get smaller and have a larger proportion of the cells in that group be capable of utilizing that oxygen to grow faster, to, to divide more. They, they tend to win in these evolutionary simulations. And then as you, it, despite their lower survival, because we're, we're always saying bigger provides better survival, right? Despite their lower survival, they still win by getting smaller. Right. But then you pump in enough oxygen to the system that they can both get big and have high survival and use the oxygen well. And there's no longer a conflict. They don't have to get small to use the oxygen. And that's really what, in, what we think is driving this suppression of, of multicellular size from oxygen. That small amounts effectively is saying like, here's a valuable resource. But if you're big, you don't get to use it very yep. well. And so that's a very strong selective incentive to get smaller or stay small. And you can remove that by removing oxygen entirely or pumping tons of it into the system. So one of the lessons that I got from talking to Betul was uh, 
these transitions that have a big effect on life, like oxygen, um, there's a give and take, right? Uh, there's sort of geological or even astrophysical things that happen that change conditions on Earth that that make the environment for the living organisms different. But then the living organisms feed back in quite an impressive way to what is going on mm -hmm. on Earth. So can we say something about which is more important for this second big boost in oxygen? Was it that life made more oxygen, photosynthesis, or was it something more geochemical going on? I, I am not the expert on this. Okay. I would defer to somebody <laughs> like Chris Reinhardt, who really studies this problem. But my understanding of it, that's kind of a layman's understanding, is that it's a combination of the two, that you had big changes in Earth's temperature, you had snowball Earth occurring at about that time, you have big changes in the composition of the oceans being bacterial dominated to algal dominated, you have sort of these combination of biotic and global geochemical cycles occurring, which combined drove this transition to far higher atmospheric oxygen concentrations. Okay, good, good. All right, so here we are. Um, how long ago again? We started these experiments in the very beginning, about ten years ago. No, I mean, how many billion, we... how many millions of years ago was this? <laughs> was the oh, uh... sorry, sorry. <laughs> was uh, was which one? Was the 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 more oxygenation creating multicellular life? Yeah, about five hundred. Five hundred million years ago. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Um, more oxygen and at least, if not multicellularity, then at least growth in the size of the unicellular organisms would be expected by then. And as you've, as you've made the case already, this uh, is a good allower or it opens the floodgates to becoming uh, multicellular in interesting ways. So did the act we know, did the actual yeast like the fungi you're looking at become multicellular or is it, is it uh, other things that did? You mean around 500 million yeah, years 500 ago? Yeah, 500 million years ago. Yeah, that's, so that's the time period in which, in which I think there's sort of a flowering, a renaissance of mm -hmm. multicellularity around the world. Now, to be clear, I think a lot of things had already been multicellular, but they were kind of largely small, sort okay. of unimpressive, things you wouldn't really notice. You know, animals probably evolved to form small multicellular groups 800 million years ago, okay. but it wasn't until about 550 million years ago that there's just this huge explosion in animal diversity. You know, land plants didn't really begin to, to colonize uh, colonize land and, 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 you know, begin this arms race of getting larger and more complex until around 450 million years ago. Um, and in terms of like the seaweeds, for example, the seaweeds like red algae um, and, and green algae, they had been around since over a billion years ago, but those are very small. And you really see this explosion in, in seaweed diversity and size around the same time. And then the brown algae, like the, the dominant kelps that you see if you go to the ocean and look at, you know, look at the, look at the, the sand that's covered with these big brown kelp, mm -hmm. those actually are kind of the most recent kid on, they're the new kid on the multicellular block. They evolved roughly 200 million years ago, and we don't really have that much evidence of what their actual ancestor looked like, despite the fact that that's one of the most recent multicellular transitions. I'm so glad I'm not a biologist. It's just too complicated. <laughs> I don't know how you keep the different colors of algae yes. uh, in, in mind, but... But good. Um, this might be a slight digression, but maybe it's exactly the right time to talk about mm -hmm. the fact that not only do the sizes and stickiness of your cells and your yeast change, but the shapes uh, change as well. And you've done interesting work on sort of the physics behind mm -hmm. packing cells together <laughs> and statistical mechanics and things like that. So it's always important to remember that as organisms evolve, it's not just changing the genome and giving yourselves new capacities. There's real physics constraints here that, that shape mm -hmm. what is possible and what is not. That's totally true. And I think that's, it's true for everything. And it's very, it's, it's maybe more true than, than on almost any other biological system that I know of for the early evolution of multicellularity in the sense that, you know, forming a group of cells requires these simple multicellular organisms to construct, to confront stresses that act over length scales that they have no history of dealing mm. with. <laughs> They're used to dealing with stresses that act over a few microns. They're not used to stresses that act over 50 microns, a hundred microns. They're not used to dealing with, with avoiding how cell packing causes strain to accumulating groups and causes them to fracture. So, so understanding how multicellular organisms evolve is not just a question of biology and understanding cellular differentiation and gene regulation and all these things that biologists tend to think about, but it's also a question of how 
multicellular bodies become these sort of biophysically tough, robust structures. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you can think of this for, through the lens of sort of Darwinian uh, ma materials. Okay. That a body is a Darwinian material. And it's something which evolves and started out pretty bad and gets <laughs> good. And how do they do that, right? right? We kind of understand how modern organisms make, you know, strong, tough uh, bodies. But they probably do it very differently from, from the way that nascent multicellular organisms would have done it because modern organisms are essentially built through a pattern, a, a process of development, which can take physical strain into account, which can minimize, which can optimize cell packing in a way that, that reduces strain accumulation. It's all coordinated. Early multicellular organisms, they don't have this coordination. So how do they do it? Right. Uh, and so this is a long time collaboration with Peter Yunker, who's a mm -hmm. soft matter biophysicist at Georgia Tech. Um, and we recently have a, we put a paper on the archive with Ray Goldstein, who's at Cambridge, um, looking at the statistical mechanics of cell packing in multicellular organisms. Now we focused really on just two model, model organisms to do our experiments in. Number one, snowflake yeast, which is a dumb clump of cells at this point. We're talking, mm -hmm. you know, essentially the, the origin, the original snowflake yeast, it hasn't evolved yet for any appreciable amount of time in the lab. And also a green algae, Volvox which you may have seen pictures of this in various textbooks or just online. They form this cool sphere of cells where the, the entire center, it's like a marble of extracellular matrix, and the cells are actually located around the, on the surface. Okay. So we thought about sort of what are the fundamental properties of a simple group of cells, right? Multicellular organisms really differ. If noise arises during, during growth and development, that can be catastrophic to an organism. We sort of know how ex ex existing organisms do it, but we don't know how, how nascent ones do. So we looked at the distribution of, of cell-free volumes within these clusters. And the reasoning for that, the logic was that despite the fact that multicellular organisms are all very different, uh, you know, they can have cells growing like a tree or they can have cells on the surface of a sphere of, of extracellular jelly. They all share one thing in common, which is that cells take up space. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of go back to what we understand about the packing of uh, materials like sand grains or something, it turns out that you get universal packing statistics for things where their particles take up space. And in fact, this arises from uh, maximum entropy considerations and the distribution of cell free volumes or the, or the amount of free space around each particle is distributed with a K gamma distribution. And that's, that's in fact indicative of a sort of this maximum entropy uh, driven cell packing. You'll have to explain what a K gamma distribution is. I think you're probably, I'm not a physicist, so you're probably <laughs> in a better, better place to explain that than I am. <laughs> I actually don't know that specific one, but, but basically what you're saying is that there's some um, probability distribution over different uh, ways you can arrange yourself and it's like some power law or, or something like that. And it's predictable based on saying, given the macroscopic constraints, let's maximize our entropy. Exactly. If every possible configuration of cell packing were equally probable, you would get a distribution of cell packings that, that is very, in fact, quite likely and not a very unlikely distribution um, based on just this very simple assumption where there's no free parameter fitting. You just need to know a few things about hmm. your system and you can, you can get a predicted distribution of cell packings based on, based on this assumption. And what does that have to do with the, is, well, sorry, I guess what I should say is, yeah, are the differences between different kinds of macroscopic morphologies mostly down to the shape of the individual cells, or is it the stickiness of the cells with each other or something more complex? I, I think the biggest difference has to do with how the cells arrange themselves in the group. So there's a sort of, uh, there's a sort of palette of different ways that multicellular groups can form. Okay. You can have trees arising where essentially daughter cells bud from a mother cell and remain attached. So you can imagine that, you know, you're adding ping pong balls onto existing ping pong balls and you just continue percolating the growth of this group, right? Or you can have something where you have a sphere of cells and, you know, a, sphere, a, a spherical group and the cells are arranged on the surface. Or you can have cells that are sticky, actually sticky, and come aggregate together into a big blob because they're, you know, they're, they're attractive to each other. Uh, or you can have something where, you know, you have one cell that gets really big and then undergoes a series of repeated smaller and smaller divisions until it forms right. a group of nested cells within a sort of exter exterior cell wall. All of these things actually occur in nature as, as routes to multicellularity. Mm -hmm. it's one, of the, one of the cool things about multicellularity is that it's very, very diverse. And 
when we looked at the snowflake yeast, which is basically a brand new model organism, it's had no time to adapt to being multicellular. It's not even really a multicellular organism. It's a dumb clump of cells. And we look at Volvox, which have been around for 200 million years and have development on our a very bona fide multicellular organism. They both fit this maximum entropy distribution really, really well. And then if we simulate the growth of different groups, according to those four different things that I just described, we can, you know, we can, we can grow them through different rules and look at them and, and then, you know, partition space, they all fit this maximum entropy distribution very, very well. And this is cool. It's cool for a couple of reasons. Number one, it tells us that there's so, so, sort of a multicellular ground state, that if you're going to form a group of cells, the distribution of cellular packing is probably going to be predicted by this maximum entropy prediction. And um, you can probably get away from that to some, to some degree with, with coordinated multicellular development, but it's a starting point. Okay, yeah. And number two, it helps us understand, I think, one of the larger conceptual challenges in understanding how multicellularity arises, which is it helps us understand how groups of cells get heritable traits, even without multicellular developmental programs. Maybe I should unpack that a little bit. Yes. I mean, this is exactly where I wanted to go because, uh, I mean, let's phrase it in, in the following way. Um, as I understand the snowflake yeast, they're multicellular in the sense that you got a bunch of cells and they're sticking together <laughs> to make a big snowflake right. kind of shape. Yes. But it's not the kind of multicellularity that we're familiar with in the macroscopic world where there's huge cell differentiation and there's organs mm -hmm. and things like that, even mm -hmm. though the underlying Correct. DNA is the same. And so that's even if you say, OK, I've made a transition to multicellularity, there's this other big transition looming in front of us about how you uh, have cell differentiation within what you would call an organism. And, and mm -hmm. that raises the question of what even counts as a true multicellular organism. Right. And, and I'm going to sidestep the philosophical discussion here, unless you want to have it, because it can take about 10 minutes. Um, we'll come back to it. But, but yeah, do the, do the okay, biology cool, discussion cool, cool. first. Yeah. So I think the way to think about multicellularity is that forming a group of cells gives you a multicellular group, but it's not a multicellular organism. Right. And in, in, in order for something to be an organism, you need to sort of have there's actually a philosophical literature on what counts as an organism. <laughs> and it kind of boils down to, you know, the organism contains interacting components in which, you know, there's essentially mutual adaptation and, a climate, you know, and, and essentially functionality. Like, so th those elements are baked into what an organism is. And in order to, and essentially the way I like to think about multicellularity is that in order to get all these complex features, which is frankly why we care about multicellularity, if mm -hmm. multicellularity was just d little clumps of cells, like we wouldn't really, we'd be talking about biofilms. We wouldn't be talking about right. multicellular organisms. So in order to, to get those features that make multicellularity so rich as a, as a, as a system, uh, to have the sort of power to change the planet's biosphere, which, it, which it did. Um, you need, you know, these dumb clumps of cells to evolve to become more complex. And therefore, it, this is it actually becomes a, a evolutionary description where these clumps of cells actually gain these increased features across generations via Darwinian evolution. And so that means that groups of cells actually need to essentially have the properties of a Darwinian entity. And okay. the cool thing about a Darwinian entity is that it's an algorithm. This applies to anything, living or non-living. You only need a few things to be true in order to have in order to have a population of, of things evolve uh, via Darwinian evolution. And so you need to have you know whatever entity it is replicate. It needs to have variation amongst different entities. That variation needs to be at least somewhat heritable, mm -hmm. and their 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 success, either their ability to reproduce or survive, their persistence in the population, their frequency in the population, needs to depend on those traits that are varying and heritable. And if you have all of those things met, then your population will evolve, right? Essentially, if selection is acting on a trait and it's heritable, then your population will change over time to have more of that trait. That's true for single cells. It's true for ants. It's true for dogs. It's true for chemistry. It's true for computer programs. Yeah. <laughs> this, is just a, this is just a feature of, of the world, right? It's a logical argument. And so in order for a multicellular group to have those properties, right, you, you need to have some way that that group reproduces and makes more groups. It needs to have variation in multicellular traits. That variation needs to be heritable and selection needs to act on those multicellular traits. And if those properties are true, then over generations, you can see those multicellular groups evolving. And in fact, 
over long periods of time, I think that's how complexity arises. Okay, but um, I, I think I'm on board with everything you just said. Um, okay. But at the, at sort of, I guess that's a high level description of what we want to happen. Uh, is there mm -hmm. a sort of nitty gritty description of at what point? Uh, you go from a snowflake where basically, mm -hmm. if I understand the snowflakes, every cell is identical, you know, it's just except for except for their location in the mm -hmm. snowflake. Mm -hmm. But so mm -hmm. at some point there has to mm -hmm. be um, a way of saying, no, you become this kind of cell and mm -hmm. you over there become right. that kind of cell. Is that very far away from where we are now? Uh, no, I think that's already happening, or? actually. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, and but it took, you know, uh, thousands of generations of laboratory evolution to get to that point. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe this is a, a, a good point to be a little bit more explicit about yeah. the uh, long-term evolution experiment. Sure. Yeah. So about five years ago in my lab, uh, Ozan Bozdag, a, a staff scientist in my group, set up this cool experiment where we'd actually been trying for years to figure out how to do a long-term yeast evolution experiment for, you know, selecting on a multicellular trait. And we had kept we kept running into these problems where they basically would they would evolve to get larger and then they plateau and then they just sit there for you know half a year and nothing was changing and we were getting ready to throw up our hands and think maybe maybe this is not a Darwinian system hmm. maybe it doesn't have the properties that I just described and then he actually started playing around with these oxygen experiments which is actually led to a key breakthrough which is that it, it turns out that we had been doing all of our experiments in a low oxygen environment, and that oxygen was constraining ah. our system. So they just could, there was no advantage to getting larger. And so it was pegging it at a small size. So we redid the system with anaerobic yeast, so yeast with no, with no functional mitochondria, with aerobic yeast, and with mixotrophic yeast. And we did this thing where we grew them every day, and we, you know, we basically let them sit on the bench, and we took the ones that got to the bottom and transferred them to fresh media. And we did that, you know, every day. We've been doing it now for over a thousand transfers, which is around five thousand generations. And we s kind of escalated the the, the rate, the, the length of the strength of settling selection. So now we're only letting them settle for ten seconds, <laughs> so they have to <laughs> just fall like rocks to the bottom of the tube. <laughs> Otherwise, they're they're killed. <laughs> and over this time, we saw the evolution of of snowflake yeast that are visible to the naked eye. So they're they're macroscopic. They're bigger than a fruit fly. <laughs> okay. And this is this was pretty surprising because it required um so so number one, this this already tells us, just connecting to what I was talking about, this already tells us that they are that that they are a Darwinian entity, right? That they have these properties yeah. in order to allow them to evolve because they're getting tens of thousands of times larger than their ancestors. And we and we can actually freeze, we freeze our populations in a minus eighty deep freezer uh, about every fifty generations. And so we can we can actually go back and pull out our living fossil record. So we know exactly how they're changing. We can compete existing organisms with any of their ancestral time points at any time that we want. We can sequence them. We know what all the mutations are. are. We know what many of them are doing, not all of them, but, but a large number of them. We can really understand the system. And we can understand the biophysics of how these guys mm -hmm. evolved to get big. And so if, so mean, there's a lot of different routes that we could take in the discussion at this point. We could talk about, we just sort of talked a little bit about the, how physics informs the origin of heredity. So maybe it's a good time to sort of touch back to that. And then we can talk about the physics of how they evolve these bigger, much tougher bodies. Well, first, I just want to mention, you know, it's we're all familiar with selective breeding, right? We make different breeds mm -hmm. of dogs and things like that. And am I right to say that the difference here is uh, you're you're not being that selective like you have a, a single thing you're doing mm -hmm. you're letting things fall mm -hmm. to the ground but you're not mm -hmm. sort of fiddling in a kind of uh interventionist way with like this yeast versus that yeast you know it's, it's basically right. you've put them in a harsh environment and watched them evolve according to their own lights not because you're pre-selecting some kind of traits that's a really really good point uh, in fact people in the field often make the distinction between artificial selection where you would be looking for a specific trait and picking those individuals and they'd be constituting the next generation or sort of experimental evolution in the lab where you have a selective scheme that you're imposing, but you are letting them figure out the traits and phenotypes and things that sort of, you know, best optimize fitness in that environment. And you're just letting them run. And it's definitely the latter. Right. Like we, we are not uh, picking winners. <laughs> and, and we should give some credit to the inspiration from Richard Lenski's long-term evolution experiment. <laughs> 
that's that's entirely why we're doing this. I don't think we we would have even had the thought. <laughs> so explain to do this without, what that is because his work. you know they tell the audience what that experiment was. Yeah. So is. so Rich Lensky is um, in many ways the the sort of founder of the field of experimental evolution, and he has this incredible uh, long term experiment in E. coli that's been going on now for maybe almost 80,000 generations. I know it's between 75,000 and 80,000. And so it's by far the longest running continuous evolution experiment. And he, it's been going for 30 years. And, and, and so, you know, throughout this, this really unique data set, we've learned a lot of fundamental things about the way evolution works. Because you just, you can't look at any other system in nature and look at so many generations in this exact same environment. Yeah. You know, we've learned that basically adaptation never stops it's a power law <laughs> it doesn't asymptote uh you know we've learned cool things about how novel gene function arises we've learned cool things about just basic microbial evolution we've learned cool things about the origin of of and maintenance of diversif- diversified microbial strategies uh and, and because he's done this in 12 replica populations we've learned a lot about chance and you know sort of uh necessity in the process of evolution and so you, you of course, um, in your version of the experiment, um, I mean, number one, I should say, kudos, because this is clearly a very long-term commitment for, <laughs> for a lab or for a person or whatever, and you have to keep it up, right? I mean, you can't just yes. like leave it. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. You still yeah. take off holidays. <laughs> Someone's got to be in the lab. Um, and y- y- the difference being that you have a, a, a window onto this multicellular transition, presumably, whereas right. uh, Lenski is looking at just, he's stuck with a unicellular E. coli that are evolving in their own ways. Yeah, that's right. I think that's one of the really exciting things about our experiment is that, you know, we are doing, we are in year three of, of 30 or so. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I do, I really, and I agree, it's, it's hard work really hats off to Ozon for, for being, you know, this completely consistent, <laughs> utterly committed scientist who has come in, you know, a thousand days in a row to do these experiments. We really don't like to pause the experiment if we can help it because it throws off the dynamics of the way that the populations are evolving. Well, I was you just know, going to ask, is it even possible mm-hmm. in principle to pause it? Can you just like put everything in the freezer and come yes. back? Okay. Yeah, ex- exactly. And we've had to do it several times, you know, okay. uh, you know, the, the incubator overheats and everything dies sure. or you get contamination and you have to go back to a time point. But and those things happen. But we try to minimize it because the, actually the population dynamics are are, are really interesting and take <laughs> days to reestablish and are really uh, non-trivial, especially yeah. when you get large groups that have different probabilities of survival, stuff like that. And are you also doing sort of separate parallel versions of it to see differences in ways yes. things can evolve? So we have basically 15 evolving populations, okay. uh, five of which can't use oxygen. So five are replicates of a genotype that started out with broken mitochondria, anaerobics, five of which are mixotrophs, and five of which are um, obligate aerobes. And are they all in the same environment or are they different environments? They're all in the same environment. Okay. Yep. And are you hopeful that someday uh, the ones that can't use oxygen will discover how to? Is that something to... I don't Imagine. think so. In fact, if you if we sequence them, you look at their mitochondrial genome, yeah. and uh, it's all gone except for a few origins of replication. So there are like they've given there up are, on oxygen. Uh, you know, an order of magnitude more mitochondrial genomes, but they are several orders of magnitude smaller. <laughs> right. I mean, this so is they pretty much their it, mitochondria are gone. It's one of but, the issues with evolution, right? Is that it? It. Yes. it generally proceeds by small steps. So if there's a place you could mm-hmm. imagine getting to uh, mm-hmm. that would be better for you, but the mm-hmm. only route to get there is through a valley <laughs> that is worse for you, evolution yes. will, roughly speaking, never get you there. That's right. That's right. That's that's why a horizontal gene transfer can be you know very powerful and that you can bring in things yeah. from totally different lineages. And actually, that's the reason that synthetic biology, I think, has potential to do really cool things that you wouldn't expect to evolve. Yeah. Um, because you would have never been able to put these things together, either valley crossing or just moving machinery from one disparate lineage into another. Finally, some intelligent design after, you know, it's been yeah. uh, thought about for hundreds of years. Okay, exactly. so uh, good. So what you, were, you wanted to say with that on the ground, uh, on the table, uh, something about the physics of uh, what we're learning yeah, for this yeah. experiment? Okay, so in order, so we're selecting for larger size. And again, over, I, I guess I should say our listeners can take a look at our preprint to read about this work. It's on the bio archive. Mm-hmm. Or if you just find my Twitter thread, uh, Twitter feed, uh, just Google my name, Will Ratcliffe. Um, 
they, we, I, I sort of walked through the paper in that Twitter thread. So you don't have to read a scientific paper to sort of see what we're doing, but it actually has a bunch more cool visuals. It's, uh, it's I can link to both explainer. in the show notes. So people should check them out on preposterousuniverse.com oh, slash podcast. Yeah. Excellent. Show notes. Perfect. So, um, over the course of 5,000, you know, generations of, of experimental evolution, uh, the anaerobic yeast evolved to get, you know, 20,000 times bigger than their ancestor. The aerobic and mixotrophic yeast, which can use oxygen, are actually pegged just a few times bigger than their ancestor. So, oh. you know, we've selected on them for 5,000 generations. They don't do anything in terms of size, which is kind of neat. It's a, mm -hmm. I think it's a nice follow-up to the oxygen work that I mentioned before, a nice long-term evolution experiment. So the anaerobes, they've gotten huge. And we actually know a lot about the physics of how, um, of how multicellular groups uh, grow to, to a certain size, how snowflake yeast grow to a certain size before they break. And it turns out that fracture in this case is driven by cells dividing into the interior of the group, causing packing, uh, strain accumulating from cell cell packing. And when that strain accum accumulating uh, from packing exceeds the strength of a cell cell connection, you break a branch. And much like cutting a branch off a tree, when you break a branch of a snowflake, it floats away. And, and that's actually cool because connecting to the Darwinian algorithm argument I talked about before, this is a way that one group can make multiple groups. As it grows, it breaks off branches. Those branches then grow back to approximately the parent size. They begin to break and you get this you know, sort of life cycle. And there's actually been a fair amount of work devoted to understanding how multicellular life cycles arise. And I think this physical packing causing strain mechanism is an extremely simple one. It's robust. It gives a very nice life cycle. And it does something which is actually very important in the context of biology here. It introduces genetic bottlenecks. If you imagine mm. that, like, you know, you have a branch of cells where imagine it's sort of like you have a ping pong ball and you put a ping pong ball on the top of it. And each of those cells has a new ping pong ball on top of it. And then all of them get another ping pong ball popped off. That bottom ping pong ball is the sort of parent of everything downstream, right? Mm -hmm. It's the progenitor cell. And it's, you know, three generations back, but it's the progenitor cell. So if you take, if you imagine that that's actually just a branch in a bigger snowflake, and you were to break that branch off, then that cell at the base of that branch is actually the genetic parent of everything downstream. Mm -hmm. So as mutations arise within these branches and you break the branches, you're actually segregating genetic variation between groups. That actually turns out to be profoundly important for allowing mutations to arise, which change the properties of cells, which have emergent properties that change the properties of groups. And selection can act on the groups themselves, but because all the cells in the group have the same genotype, they have the same mutation. Now there's a statistical correlation between the group level trait and a genetic trait in the cells. And so if you select on that gr emergent group trait, well, they also, there's an underlying genetic basis. And now you can actually drive continued Darwinian evolution. So this is though um, not what we see in cell differentiation in big uh, organisms where the underlying DNA is all the same, but they're just expressed differently. This is true uh, genome differentiation between different parts of the snowflake, and then maybe a part can break off and really be a different kind of organism. I, I think the way that I would uh, sort of compare this to extant organisms is that this is similar to having mutations in a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. And so, or like in, in a lineage of cells that leads up to a fertilized egg. And so the egg is now the bottleneck that yeah. entire organism develops with the same genetic under basis. And so, you know, in any organism that has single cell propagules, you have a bottleneck proper. In our organism, you don't have single cell propagules, but you have these branches that actually act kind of in the same way yeah. <laughs> that it basically, in, in fact, you can calculate like the maximum waiting time for genetic variation to be partitioned between groups. And it's not very long. It sort of sets up an expectation that sooner or later, any mutation that arises will be partitioned off into its own group, and then you'll never have admixture between that group and another group again. So it's a, it's a one way direction towards breaking up, you know, mutations that arise within an organism and making it between organisms. And then is there competition in the test tube between the different? Oh, uh... yes, it's an arms <laughs> race, just like the trees getting taller yeah. is an arms race. In our case, we don't, we don't transfer all of the clusters that survive in a given set of time, like 30 seconds to, of sinking. We only transfer the bottom of mm -hmm. the group of cells that are racing to the bottom. And so there's a continual arms race dynamic here where it's not good enough just to get to the bottom in 10 seconds or th 30 seconds. You've got to beat everyone else trying to get to the bottom in 30 seconds. 
Have you ever read the short story by Theodore Sturgeon called Microcosmic God? No. <laughs> oh, you should. <laughs> it's from many That's decades great. ago, but it's basically a, a genius inventor buys his own island and then creates some microorganisms and subjects them to really, really harsh conditions so they evolve really quickly and, and develop intelligence. And then he makes them invent things for them and he sells them to the rest of the world and becomes rich and Oh my complications gosh, ensue but yeah, i'm just be... <laughs> saying i'm just saying that you know if this academia uh, thing doesn't work out for you there might be another way to mm. you know <laughs> mm. earn a living might take it might take a few more transfers <laughs> well yeah because it does so i mean it, it's pretty rapid your your evolution but it's not it's very fast that rapid i mean it, but it's still you know generations several generations per day not a million generations per day yeah we're getting five generations a day and you know it's frustrating because it's it's a log of <laughs> of the of the you know numerical number increase. So you have these hundredfold expansions of population size a day, and that's you know six right. and six and three quarters generations, and it's not even really hundredfold; it's like sixtyfold. <laughs> well, so but it's, it goes it's not that many generations. It goes but. back to my my point that um, physicists would be puzzled by how something that has a time scale measured in mm -hmm. minutes or hours uh, can mm -hmm. change over a time scale of a billion years in a, in a profound mm -hmm. way. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, the reason why, if you forced a physicist at gunpoint to say, how could that happen? Well, there must be, you know, the, the billion year time scale must be the small time scale times a big number, a big dimensionless mm -hmm. number, right? And, mm -hmm. and that big dimensionless number has must have to do with the space of possibilities for these genomes to evolve, right? Which is just huge. There's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of different mutations that could go on. So, I mean, how do you, I guess in, in part you're dealing with that just by making the environment really harsh and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, nudging them to evolve quickly. Um, but is there some, I mean, how do you deal with the fact that even though you're doing a lot of generations, it's nothing compared mm -hmm. to a billion years worth of evolution? It's nothing. <laughs> so yeah, so we can do some cool tricks uh, to to get around some of these things, which is we can we can use synthetic biology tools to bring in th features that evolved over millions of mm. years and see what they do in our system, which is really fun. So for example, Tony Bernetti, a postdoc in our group, who is a synthetic biology whiz, um, has been basically engineering our yeast to express myoglobin, which is an oxygen binding molecule. And we actually took the sequence uh, from a sperm whale. We optimized it to be expressed in yeast, stuck it into yeast, and it works. <laughs> They're making sperm whale myoglobin. <laughs> They're pink. They're pink yeast. And so, you know, we basically think that these oxygen binding molecules, their whole thing is not like holding on oxygen as a battery. It's to increase the diffusion rate of oxygen through, through a tissue. Mm. And so we can, we can test the hypothesis that that increasing diffusion rates of oxygen through a tissue would interact synergistically over evolutionary time to drive something to become bigger by removing constraints of size that are associated with oxygen. And sure enough, that's that's what it appears to be doing. I mean, these papers are not out yet. This is work that's ongoing. But you know, we took we took a uh, myoglobin from a <laughs> from a sperm whale, myohemerythrin from a peanut worm, which lives in deep sea sediments and has a very low oxygen environment. And then we actually took a, there's a published paper from Joe Thornton's group where they, they use ancestral sequence reconstruction to identify the, the ancestor of uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin. So, you know, we made that gene too. <laughs> Stuck it into our yeast. <laughs> so, not? you know, so it's not just sitting around twiddling your thumbs waiting for evolution to happen in, in the test tubes. You are, you're sometimes taking an active role and, and poking at it and seeing what can happen. Absolutely. Yeah. There's actually a whole lot more crazy synthetic biology that Tony is up to. Um, I could I could tell you if you're interested. Yeah. Um, but I can, but I kind of also want to get back to the to the physics of this. I'm sorry. I feel yeah, like I we did. never really we went down that path. Got off that uh, off that trail. But yes, let's complete the physics discussion. Okay. So um, so initially, what all of our yeasts that are evolving to become macroscopic do is they make more and more elongate cells, mm -hmm. and we we really understand how this affects size and and, and uh, by affecting the, the, essentially the amount of free space around individual cells and the amount of jamming that occurs inside a cluster. If you imagine before that you were building a snowflake yeast by adding ping pong balls onto, onto the tree of ping pong balls, you can see how that would get very dense very quickly. And it would kind of jam and break apart. But now imagine you're doing the same thing with hot dogs, 
-hmm. you have a, you know, the same group has a lot more free space. It's mm -hmm. a lot more fluffy. And as a result, you don't have as much jamming. And, and when they do finally jam, they're at a much, much larger size. So all of our replicate populations are basically getting mutations, which increase the length of cells, which increases group size. And this slowly, you know, this, this increase in group size is fairly slow. Over several hundred generations, we're getting, you know, tenfold increase in size. And then we see this surprising break from this sort of linear march towards sl slightly increased size. We see things that are orders of magnitude bigger hmm. with just a little bit more cell length. And if we, in fact, look at how these things are packing Normally, we expect that, that more elongate cells are fluffier and there's less densely packed. But if you make these th things have slightly longer cells, then all of a sudden, they're packing more and more densely within these clusters, which is not what we expect based on sort of physical first principles. And so it turns out what's happening is we're having this shift, which, in fact, if you're, you're into phase transitions, I think this is something which probably is one. But Sounds we're, like it, We're yeah. working on this to, to know if it really is. We see this shift from cells being basically branches on a tree that if you break a single cell, the entire branch falls away to cells being entangled like vines such that the cells wrap around uh. adjacent cells. And now if you want to move that one cell, then you're moving its entangled components and it's, and it's entangled components, entangled components. And it turns out that that entanglement percolates throughout the entire cluster. And these groups become orders of magnitude more tough. In fact, in, if you look at the materials property of them, they go from being 100 times weaker than gelatin in, as the ancestral snowflake yeast. If you break a single cell-cell bond, the material breaks apart, hmm. which is great for getting a life cycle, but very bad for making a tough organism. You go from 100 times weaker than gelatin to snowflake yeast that are as tough and strong as wood. And it's like a cord that is made from, you know, wrapping thread, you know, various yeah. strands of thread. Yeah, Ex exactly. And is that primarily or is this an answerable question is that primarily because of the configuration space and some physics or is it because you're selecting for bigness and toughness and and the yeast discovered how to do that in a new way i think it's the latter <laughs> but i'd like to talk to peter yunker yeah. my physics collaborator more to to be sure he sees it the same way i do but I mean, we are providing a massive you know fitness incentive to get big and mm -hmm. outcompete your competitors if you get big and these things that are entangled are you know, thousand times bigger than anything that came before them. Like they're, they're humongous. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to have to increase the size of your actually, test tubes at some point? Are they going to become too big, your, your yeast? I don't, I, I, I doubt it. Okay. Um, because, and, and there's, a, there's a reason baked into the way that we transfer them. We don't actually let the entire test tube compete to settle at the end of every day. We subsample 10% of it, and those yeasts compete to be transferred. So they actually have a 90% chance of dying without ever even having a chance to compete for faster settling. And that I think actually sets a sort of maximum size to which they can grow okay. before dilution just kind of gets, gets the better of them, which, and actually that's very important because it's something which was able to grow forever would actually be a very boring organism. It would probably kind of break right. our system. We want things that, that actually reproduce and die. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and we kind of enforce that through this mechanism. Okay. So, so, but getting back to phase transitions, I yeah. think that this, this is something we're working on, but it, I think that this entanglement, idea is probably an example of a phase transition that as soon right. as something has the potential to entangle its neighbors that percolates throughout the entire cluster and you go from something where you're one fracture away from from reproduction to having to break hundreds of bonds and there's not very much in middle ground and it sounds like um something that is actually taking advantage of the feature of multicellularity. You know, it's not just getting bigger by adding more cells. It's uh, right. getting a good survival characteristic by mm -hmm. doing something that a multicellular organism can do that a unicellular organism can't. That's right. And in fact, if you look, we spend a lot of time thinking about entanglement in biology, and it turns out it's a relatively understudied research area. Um, but if you look at the largest fungi that have ever existed, there's something called prototaxides, a fungus from the Devonian 400-ish million years ago that formed these three foot tall, 20, sorry, three foot wide, 25 foot tall columns of, of fungal mycelium. And if you look at, and, and they're fossilized so well, you can take thin sections of them and look at them and you see, I mean, they're, they're beautifully entangled. <laughs> the hyphae are basically <laughs> going in, in, yeah. in two different directions. They're wrapping around each other. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, and actually, as Peter and myself and, and perhaps David Hu as well, who's a 
he was at Georgia Tech and works on the mechanics of, of biology, we're beginning to think more about like how prevalent is entanglement actually in biological systems? You know, for example, is rhino horn an example of a, a good example of an entangled material? It's made from hair that's kind of all meshed up and matted down in this horn. And, and those hairs are, are not just like perfectly parallel. So, you know, how much is entanglement actually underlying a lot of the materials properties of multicellular organisms? But we don't typically think of it that way because, you know, they have glue or, you know, they have bonds between cells or something like that. But it, it's it's clearly, you know, a nice way uh, that the possibility of cooperative behavior is changing mm -hmm. the qualitative features of the organism, right? That's right. And so getting back to something you said earlier, the way we introduced talking about the multicellularity long-term evolution experiment was, are we going to see cellular differentiation, right? When are we going to see cells performing different things? And, and we're actually investigating this in the context of entanglement right now, in the okay. sense that our yeast cells are all genetically the same, but that does not mean that they're physiologically the same. In fact, we see big differences in, in evolved, differences that have evolved over our experiment in the behavior of young cells that are sort of weighted towards the surface and older cells that are in on the interior of the cluster. It turns out that older cells are much more likely to divide from the middle of the cell, making a right angled branch, oh. which is something which drives entanglement. New cells, young cells, first generation cells are much more likely to be popped off the tip of the cells. And in fact, it looks like this is to some extent being coordinated by changes in the expression of chaperone proteins, which which, is, which, which have a very broad role in the cell. But if we play with the expression of these chaperone proteins, we can actually change these phenotypes. So we, and, and so basically what we see is that over cellular age, these things are growing outwards. So the internal cells are old, the external cells are young. We're seeing the evolution of new age dependent cellular behaviors, right. which may be in fact important for driving the entangled, entanglement phenotype and giving these groups really robust uh, materials properties. Well, and so also, this would be an example. Yeah. yeah, is it is it too much to say like this? This could be the hint of the beginning of true cellular differentiation and, and expression. Yeah, that's exactly how we are thinking of it. Is that yeah. it's sort of like if they don't have um, this is one way to get this right. Like there is a reliable distribution of of like age provides a reliable signal for where the cell is. If it's young, it's probably on the outside. If it's old, it's probably on the inside. And we know that yeast actually have all these things that are that are expressed differentially in age already. So that's actually a lever that's easy for them to pull. And what we seem to be seeing is them pulling on this lever of changing the expression of this chaperone protein, which changes the, the, the distribution of budding, which then changes how entanglement proceeds. Pretty amazing. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and the most amazing thing is that you're not taking billions of years to see it happen. By just nudging right. it a little bit, you're able to see it uh, in the lifetime of a postdoc. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and the other thing that's really cool from my perspective is that a lot of this stuff is stuff that I would never have been able to predict before right. doing the experiment. That's you know, a lot of them. experiments in biology are, are hypothesis driven, where you already have a pretty good idea of the way the system works before you even propose the experiment, you set it all up. To usually test some very low dimensional linear effect mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and like ignoring all the complications of the real world. And, you know, is this additive effect significant? Yes, it is. And those experiments are great. Don't get me wrong, but they're also limiting in that you have to already kind of understand your system well enough to be able to propose that kind of experiment before you can do it. And yeah. in our case, one of the beautiful and fun things about experimental evolution is that you don't actually necessarily have to know what you're going to get. And you can be really surprised by the, the twists and turns that your system goes on. Well, I think that is the perfect place uh, to draw this to a close because you've given us an enormous amount to think about. And that's what science is all about, being a little bit surprised about what you learn. And, you know, I'm hoping that your experiment goes on for at least 30 years. I think you're being uh, modest and it could be at least 300 years. You, you never know. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I, right. will, I will happily hand the reins over to, <laughs> to someone else. Well, unless they point. solve aging by then, you can still be the boss, you know, for the next 300 years. I don't know. Oh, yeah. That's... Well, that sounds horrible. No, yeah. no. In fact, uh, maybe even a better thing would be to encourage other people to start their own, you know, uh, forks. We can also do that. Oh, that, that's than, true. Yeah. I was going to say their own experiments, but of course we can share, yeah. right? You can, you can pass the yeast around and uh, yeah. have it evolve differently in different Labs. That sounds good to me. All right, good. A project out there for some of the folks listening to the Mindscape podcast. So, Real Ratcliffe, thanks so much for being on Mindscape. Thank you so much. I had a great time.